Right. I welcome members to the 24th meeting in 2014 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I invite members to switch off any mobile phones, please, and to note that we have received apologies from Richard Baker. Agenda item one is instruments subject to negative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Food Hygiene and Official Feed and Food Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 SSI 2014-213, nor on the Town and Country Planning Fees for Applications and Deemed Applications Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-214. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Thank you. Agenda item two is instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. The Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Act 2014, Commencement Number 2 and Saving Provisions Order 2014, SSI 2014-212. Our legal advisers have raised a couple of points in relation to this instrument. The word on has been omitted before commence, sorry, in between commence and or after that date in Article 3.2a. The effect is that the provision makes a saving in respect of any marriages or purported marriages entered into before the 1st of September 2014 and any prosecution in relation to such marriages or purported marriages where proceedings commence or after that date rather than where proceedings comment on or after that date. Does the committee therefore agree to draw this instrument to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground H as there is a lack of clarity in the meaning of Article 3.2a? The instrument also fails to bring into force for limited purposes sections 12.1, 13.1, 14.1 and 24.1 of the Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Act 2014 and paragraph 1.1 of Schedule 1 and paragraph 1 of Schedule 2 to that Act. These provisions introduce the various amendments which order seeks to bring into force and specify which act is being amended. In commencing the amendments without the introductory provisions, the instrument may create uncertainty for users of the legislation. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting ground? Does the committee also agree to note, however, that the Scottish Government has laid an amending instrument before the Parliament in order to remedy both of these points raised on the instrument? No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014, Commencement Number 2 and Transitional Provision Order 2014, SSI 2014-210. However, the Committee may wish to note that Article 3 of the Order contains complex transitional provisions which enable persons with rights prior to the 13th of August to receive information in relation to offences under the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003 as amended to benefit from the enhanced information and representation provisions commenced by the order. Given the complexity and length of these provisions, it would have been useful to the scrutiny of the order had the policy note or the explanatory note contained more detail as to the effects and purpose of the existing legislation affected by Article 3 and the effects of the article. It might have been useful had the planned timing of this instrument allowed a longer period than 19 days between the date when it was laid before the Parliament and the date when the provisions are brought into force, given that Scottish Government aims where, complex, where possible to allow a period of 20, 40 days rather, where an instrument contains complex transitional provisions. Do members have any comments to make? Stuart, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kamina. Perhaps just briefly on the 19 days, it... it uh, even with the 40 days, it, it, it's happenstance because we are normally at this time of year in uh, recess. Uh, so I'm glad we've had the opportunity to consider this. But the, the most substantial point is that uh, the policy note not explaining the substantial complexities, um, and that is the only public uh, record of uh, how this legislation is intended to work, um, I understand that further information has been supplied, but there hasn't been a reissue of the policy note that would put into the public domain that enhanced description of the effect of quite complex changes that are being made. And I think it would be appropriate for this committee to consider whether it should encourage the government to reissue the policy note in its um, full and more adequate description of the policy that they're introducing. Uh, so that uh, lawyers uh, who are operating within this framework, or indeed the courts, uh, have the benefit of that uh, more full explanation uh, when they're applying this legal provision. John. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. And I, too, uh, agree with uh, what uh, Stuart has said. Um, 
I think the length of time is not reasonable um, for our um, legal assistants to have had had the opportunity to consider this bill, uh, or at least these provisions, uh, and given that they are complex, so I'm concerned about that, um, and I think it, I'm concerned about this process almost breaking down, although there is no fault to be found with the provisions, but only after a bit of toing and froing uh, have they been explained, and therefore I think there's a, a process issue here, and uh, could I suggest um, that perhaps we write um, to um, the Standards Committee about this uh, as part of their investigation into the processes um, of Parliament with a view to making improving on them? Do, do members agree that we should at least draw that part of it to the Standards and Procedures Committee's attention? Yes, thank you. Um, I think I, 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 I'm also concerned that We've got a complex provision which has, as Stuart Stevenson said, only as a matter of happenstance come in front of us and has not got in front of the policy committee because it won't see it before it comes into force tomorrow. Um, that doesn't sound like a good procedure, albeit I think we're recognising that we believe this is okay. Um, I'm also, I, I have to say absolutely with Stuart Stevenson that if, if the policy note was inadequate for our legal advisers and they had to go back and ask other questions, then it's plainly inadequate for any legal advisor outside. Um, and therefore, if there is more explanation, it does seem sensible that that should be in the public domain for those who may have to advise their clients, which just seem to be a good way of, of legislating. So I, I think I'm going to suggest to the committee that I might write to the government along those lines. Um, and we will also write to the Standards and Procedures Committee, as suggested. So that, that then will be two letters, then? One to the government and one to the standards. Absolutely, that will be one. Uh, do members, having had uh, those comments, um, otherwise register their contentment with the instrument? Thank you. Right, agenda item three is the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. This item of business is consideration delegated powers provisions in this bill after stage two. Members will have noted that the Scottish Government has provided a supplementary delegated powers memorandum and will have seen the briefing paper. Stage three, consideration of the bill is due to take place on Tuesday the 19th of August, that is next week. The committee may therefore wish to agree its conclusions today. There are a number of powers to which the committee is invited to give particular consideration. The committee may wish to note that section 46, as amended, provides that the Scottish Tax Tribunal rules would be made by Scottish Ministers by regulations rather than by the Court of Session by Act of Sterrant. Section 46, as amended, puts in place a similar arrangement to that enacted by paragraph 4 of Schedule 9 to the Tribunal's Scotland Act 2014. Uh, that paragraph is a transitional provision which enables the Scottish Ministers to make tribunal rules and regulations until the Scottish Civil Justice Council and the Court of Session are involved in making the rules. The committee may also wish to note that until the Scottish tax tribunals become judicially administered by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service with rules drafted under the auspices of the Scottish Civil Justice Council, the tax tribunal rules will be made by the Scottish Ministers rather than by the Court of Session. In that regard, Section 46.3 is not framed as a transition arrangement. Accordingly, it appears that the intended position that tax tribunal rules would in future be made by the Court of Session would be dependent upon an appropriate provisions being enacted in future under the powers of the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014 to achieve that position. Are we agreed to note the matters which I've outlined in relation to amendment, sorry, to amended section 46 and report them accordingly? Thank you. The powers in section 71D to B 159A to B, 166A to B, 180A to B, 181G to B, and paragraph 5D to B to schedule 3, enable provision or further provision about the amounts of several penalties which are specified in the bill. Specifically, they enable Scottish ministers to charge penalty or change penalty amounts with no limit upon the extent to which they may be changed. The committee may consider that as a matter of principle and expressed by the committee in relation to previous bills, the bill should state suitable maximum levels of permitted increase in the amounts of penalties beyond which any amount specified in the regulations could not go. 
specific level of these caps is a policy matter and therefore not for this committee to make a recommendation on. However, the committee may wish to report that it does not consider it appropriate to confer upon Scottish ministers an unlimited discretion to change the penalty amounts and that it considers the setting of maximum penalties is a matter on which Parliament should legislate in the bill. Do members wish to make any comments? John. I would just say that it seems perhaps unreasonable that there are no caps on these amounts. Now, that may be the policy intention for there to be a deterrent effect that it's unlimited the level of um, penalties that, that may be applied but if that is the intention it perhaps it should be made clearer because at the moment I, uh, I'm left with the feeling that it is at best unclear Do any members have any other comments? Stuart? Um, I, I support the general thrust of what uh, John Scott is saying um, it is not particularly constraining, it seems to me, as I read the, uh, the bill that's before us, um, for the bill to contain uh, specified limits that are passed by Parliament at the outset, because uh, 71D2B, uh, uh, 71D1, Etc. Scottish ministers may, by regulation, make provision or further revision provision about penalties under this chapter, so they can subsequently be changed. There is a process for which there is a parliamentary procedure, and then similarly in relation to uh, Schedule Three at, fifth, at five D one, again there is a substantial provision that really allows ministers to bring forward regulations for parliamentary consideration about really anything related to penalties. Uh, but for us to have a lacuna between the passing of the bill and the laying of legislation, uh, secondary legislation, specifying the amount, I think is an unsatisfactory approach to take. And it'd be far better if there were to be within the bill a statement as to what uh, the, the limits are at the point the bill is passed given that the government can bring forward orders to make changes to that at a later date. And I think that's the position the committee has previously adopted in other contexts. Uh, yes, okay. Perhaps. Okay. Yes, okay. perhaps it John. would be reasonable at the very least to be seeking an explanation why the government have chosen to do it in this way rather than put it on the face of the bill. Do members share my concern that, in principle, penalties should be specified by Parliament? Yeah. And preferably in primary legislation. And the question that I'm therefore coming to is, to what extent do we feel, in principle, it's appropriate that a change to a specified penalty should be in subordinate legislation? And do we at least share my view that it must be by an affirmative procedure? I'm trying to put some flesh on the principle, which I think we've agreed before, but I'm trying to put it in the context of what we have in front of us. Stuart? Uh, Committee, I think the, the, the issue is, and, and I'm sure what the government will be likely to say to us, that they will not commence without having indicated what the penalties are to be. But the bill as passed has no penalties. A commencement order, which could include commencement of the sections of which there are a number that relate to penalties, could be brought forward by this government or a successor government. Um, and commencement orders are not subject to parliamentary procedure. So it is that window through which Parliament can find itself not having had the opportunity to formally agree to pen moving to a position where there is a regime of no penalties. There is a legal window through which it can go if the commencement order is passed before the ministers have brought forward orders to set the penalties. And it is that window which I think is unsatisfactory in the legal process. Now, ministers could uh, conclude that they, and commit to only bringing forward, to bring forward the commencement order and making it subject to parliamentary procedure. But I think that would be a rather unusual approach when the more simple way of dealing with this is for them simply to put an amendment 
uh, to this, um, this bill, which provides for an initial setting uh, of the uh, penalties and setting limits, which they have the powers to change at any subsequent point by parliamentary procedure. Can I confess that I'm now just a little bit confused, I'm, uh, and I now need to just turn to, to, to legal advisers. Are we in a position where the government is going to set numerically the limits of these penalties when the bill is passed? Yeah, the bill has no no provision for a, for a, a maximum amount of penalty, so that the it's the power to make further provision in regulations that would provide for the increased penalty amount. So the bill, the bill as it stands, has no has no maximum amount of penalty. Right. So there, so we are not expecting the bill to have any numbers in terms of a financial penalty for any offence. Uh, the bill, the, the bill specifies the initial penalty amounts. Oh, right. So, yes. so the initial ones the initial, are there. The initial ones are there. But in terms of a power to amend the penalty and a yep. power to increase the penalty, um, there is no maximum amount. Yes. Right. Sorry, that was my understanding, and I don't. I'm not convinced that was necessarily what Stuart Stevenson was addressing. And that's. Well, convener, convener, may I stand corrected as I clearly am? <laughs> Okay, I, I just want to make sure that we are, we we are talking about the same thing. So we're in a position where we're, we're in a position where uh, where the initial numbers are specified. Uh, what they are is not our, our concern because that's a policy issue at the very least. Um, but am I then entitled to remain concerned that they can be changed to any extent by subordinate legislation, which is by affirmative procedure? Is, is, that, is that understanding correct, Colin? That's correct. That's correct, yeah. right, thank you. So, convener, there is a parliamentary process that yeah. would be required. There is no window through which no. the, the, the effect can be to have unlimited uh, penalty without parliamentary process. But that does take me back, thank you, Stuart, that does take me back to my question that I started with as to, as to what extent the committee feels that, in principle, that's an acceptable place to be if the original spend, if the original penalties are on the bill, face of the bill. Uh, you know, I, 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 su I suspect I go back to um, uh, Schedule Three and Section Five D One. That, given that, and it specifically um, at Five D Two, perhaps it, it makes five provisions can change the circumstances of penalty, the amount of penalties, the procedure for issuing penalties, appealing penalties and enforcing penalties, so that there remain, unless that were to be changed, there always would be the possibility of, at a future date, changing the amounts of penalties. Um, I don't think it would exclude the possibility of their being unlimited. So, uh, But the bottom line is, I think, it, given that it's been made clear, and my confusion has now been hopefully, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat ad addressed, that, that uh, there is no place where penalties would be unlimited without Parliament agreeing to it. Uh, my concerns are substantially less than they were when I was in the more confused position I was a few minutes ago. I would have to agree with that too, thanks to the further clarification we've had. Right. Um, that, then doesn't take, that does then take me to, to, to the other point, which is that any changes in those penalties are, as I understand it, uh, for any cause. Um, whereas, again, my understanding is that the policy statement we have seen suggests that it's really to deal with the value of money, otherwise known as inflation. Um, to what extent would the committee share my view that if this power was intended to cover anything that we would call inflation, then it might just simply say so? Because that would appear to be putting on the face of the bill the real intention, which is what I th would expect us to be putting on the face of a bill. Um, can I, I convene a take a different view? Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I, think, I think we're now in a position where it is up to the government to explain when it brings forward an order to change penalties for it at that point, whatever the government then is, uh, to proffer its explanation for the reasons for doing so. And um, for my part, I would, be, I would be content to move on and not to consider this particular matter further, given that we now have an amended bill that has penalties within it as a result of our intervention in the first place. Mm -hmm. any, any other comments? Stuart? Yeah, just, uh, I mean, uh, with uh, what you're suggesting, uh, convener, I mean, I, I would uh, consider that would be a policy matter uh, as compared to an actual procedural matter, uh, if, uh, if, you, uh, if you wanted to have the inflation written into the face of the bill. So am I right in thinking that I've talked us into a position, perhaps, where the committee is content if the initial penalties are on the face of the bill and the government's option for changing those numbers, which is bound to be upwards, is by affirmative procedure but not subject to any explanation because, as I think Stuart Stevenson's correctly said, any government at any point in time may have other reasons and we'll just simply need to give them to Parliament at the time. Uh, am, am I right in thinking that's where we've got to? My position. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. In which case, I think what I've now got us to is a position where actually we're comfortable with what the government is actually proposing, which is perhaps not what we were expecting, but that's that's what discussion's about. Okay. Um, right. In which case, there's really no need to report. Right. That's fine. Thank you. Just give me half a moment while I get my pen through the appropriate words. Right. In which case, the committee may wish to note that Section 22183DA seeks to implement the committee's recommendation at Stage 1, as we've just talked about, that the exercise of the powers in Sections 102 should be subject to the affirmative procedure, and we're now comfortable with that. Thank you. Yes, that's a different issue. When we get to okay. right, thank you. Does the committee agree to report, however, that paragraph D A should refer to section 102 rather than 102.1, given that sections 102 and 103 repeatedly refer to the regulations under the whole of section 102? Agreed. We do. Yes, thank you. The committee may wish to note that Stage 1 report made recommendations on two other provisions where the Scottish Government undertook to bring forward amendments, but the provisions were not so amended at Stage 2. Firstly, the committee noted at Stage 1 that the Scottish Government would bring forward an amendment to provide that a copy of the Ministerial Guidance to Revenue Scotland issued in terms of Section 8.1 should be laid before Parliament. Secondly, the committee noted that the Scottish Government would bring forward an amendment to paragraph 31 of Schedule 2 so that there is a provision for the publication of the rules for the procedures to a fitness assessment tribunal made under the paragraph. This would be consistent with the provision of rules under paragraph 21 of that schedule. Is the committee agreed to report that its recommendations on these provisions remain the same as stage one and in so doing invite the Scottish Government to respond to these recommendations? Thank you. It's suggested the committee may wish to be content with all the other provisions in the bill which have been amended at stage two to insert, substantially alter or remove provisions conferring powers to make subordinate legislation. Are we content to report accordingly, please? Okay. I think that brings us to the end of that item, unless I've missed anything. I think it brings us to the end of the agenda and therefore to the end of the meeting. Our next meeting will be held next Tuesday, the 19th of August, and I close this meeting.